along the North Sea coast uh, is actually not very good. And an awful lot of Spain is not terribly impressive either. And Denmark, uh, which is here, is pretty good. Uh, what's happened? Well, um, if you look at uh, Germany, uh, that's the one coming up here, um, they've rolled out a pretty impressive rate. Uh, Spain started a bit later, but they're tracking pretty much step for step. Uh, Denmark, one always thinks of as being the leader in this technology, and that indeed is where much of the technology was developed. Obviously, it's a tiny country, uh, so they're uh, proportionately doing remarkably well. They have a 25% penetration already, um, but it, it's a small country. Uh, Britain is way down here. Uh, and our ambition is to get up here by 2020. And if you start from where we are and go back to where Germany was then, if we can replicate the German rate of installation, uh, then we could do it. Um, and since we have better wind, we ought to be able to do it. Uh, but we have a lot of stroppy protesters who are making life rather difficult. So, um, what happens? Uh, well, we started off with auctions, and they were incredibly successful at driving down the cost because people really did bid keenly to get the rights to develop wind sites. Uh, the problem, of course, is the winner's curse. Uh, you find out that uh, when you look at the cost of actually building it and the price you bid, uh, it doesn't make sense, and you walk away. There were no penalties for walking away. Uh, so. Um, a decreasing proportion were actually finally delivered. They started off at about 70% of the auction winners building, and we got down to about 45%. Um, I still think it was a pretty good system, but it was thought unsatisfactory because of that failure to deliver. Uh, so we then placed an obligation on the distribution companies uh, through these renewable obligation certificates, and that pays a premium, which depends on the supply and demand of these um, certificates, um, and it's regardless of where you're located, so there was no rent extraction. <clears throat> and consequently, everybody put the wind farms up in Scotland, uh, because that's where the wind is, but unfortunately, that's not where the people who want the power live, uh, and so it's induced a whole lot of very expensive transmission investment. <clears throat> it's very risky. I'll just jump ahead and show how risky it is. Uh, so we've got the, seat, uh, the smoothed uh, wholesale price, which has been pretty volatile because the fuel prices have been volatile. Uh, the renewable certificates trade at um, the supply and demand determined price, but you can bank them so there's some stability there. But the final wholesale price you get is pretty unstable. Uh, so obviously when you're here, you go to the bank and say, this is a marvelous business. And the bank turns around and says, yes, but it wasn't last week, uh, and we're not going to lend you very much money. So um, that problem uh, has uh, arguably one of the reasons why Britain with its great wind resource hasn't actually built all that much wind. Uh, so we're now reforming the market to try and overcome some of these obstacles and um, instead of doing the obvious thing of choosing the German model which has delivered huge quantities we've got this rather complicated contract um, and one of the problems is that you have to market your power and the wholesale markets are pretty illiquid. Uh, you're also exposed to imbalance risk. You sell your power a day ahead. Uh, you don't know what the wind is going to be very accurately a day ahead. Uh, and if you produce too much, you sell it at the system sell price, which is typically rather miserable. Uh, and if you sell too little, you have to buy the system buy price. We have two different prices for the same product, uh, and that can be quite penal. Uh, so it doesn't address all of the risk by any means. What should we be doing? Um, I think the auction approach makes a great deal of sense. Um, a tender auction for sites makes sense, and you would then ask people, well, what kind of contract do you want? Um, what length of contract do you want? And you could then work out which of these were the least cost to the system, uh, taking into account all of the additional costs of balancing and transmission. Uh, what would be even better if we could secure the sites and then auction them off, but uh, that's the degree of intervention into the private economy that uh, the government is very reluctant to entertain. <coughs> um, I think we have to have a dialogue with the European Union to say what is it we should be supporting um, and its reliable capacity rather than megawatt hours. Uh, and if we did that, 
uh, then we would further reduce the risk and we would also avoid the problem of negative prices uh, when you're bidding into the wholesale market uh, and you're willing to take a negative price uh, if you have a premium fit. So um, I'll skip very briefly over this. One of the consequences is if you have two possible locations for wind, uh, the east, where it isn't very windy, you get 2,000 hours a year. The north, where it's windier, 2,500 hours a year. Uh, but you have transmission costs which lower the price uh, of the uh, power at that node uh, relative to the center uh, from 50 pounds to 35 pounds. Um, now, if you have a renewable obligation certificate worth 50 pounds, uh, that then raises your price from 35 pounds up to uh, something like 80 pound, 85 pounds, and with those number of hours, uh, you would get 212,000 pounds a kilowatt. Whereas if we uh, look at down in the east, uh, you would get only 198,000 pounds. So you would choose to locate in the north. But if we pay for capacity and wind, you can see that uh, the most attractive place, bearing in mind all those transmission costs, uh, would be actually down in the east. So by supporting the output, not the capacity, we're distorting where people choose to locate and increasing system costs. But that's a dialogue we still have to uh, have with the European Union because they're measuring our performance on output, not capacity. So, uh, to summarize, uh, we have uh, an objective of trying to improve the performance and lower the cost of renewable technologies. Uh, there are a number of market failures. The carbon price isn't right. It's too low. Uh, there are particular risks that renewables face that fossil generation doesn't. There are learning benefits that we have to recognize in some form of support. Um, and these can all be separately addressed. Uh, the learning, the club good, that we have addressed very successfully. Uh, the carbon price, in Britain, we have a carbon price floor. Uh, so the real question is, what's the best way of reducing risk and concentrating the money on where the better benefits from learning arise? Um, and when you look at different systems, uh, each of them fails in some dimension. Some of them fail to recognize the system costs, some of them don't encourage the right location decisions. Some of them impose balancing costs which can't be avoided on wind power rather than allocating it to the system operator who can manage things better. Uh, and many of them fail to extract the rent uh, and therefore increase the cost of support to the consumers. Um, we're going to go offshore, that's seriously more expensive, so all of these problems are going to be further increased. Uh, so I think looking across we can find a lot of lessons from different countries None of them does it perfectly. Each of them has an interesting um, uh, lesson that can be transferred. Uh, unfortunately, civil servants are very bad at looking across national borders and learning from other countries. Uh, so the, that's where the challenge lies. And with that, I'll stop, and I've left the right number of minutes to take your questions. Please step up to the microphone if you have a, a question at the back. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Craig uh, from MIT. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions, one very quick. Uh, in terms of uncertainty in forecasting wind, is it better offshore or onshore in the UK? And the second question is, I just didn't, expl I didn't fully understand your opposition to the uh, CFD approach because it seems like if you're guaranteeing the strike price to wind producers and if you run that through an auction then you get the best sites being selected and you get a lot of certainty for investors because they know exactly the price that they'll always get for electricity. Okay, so the predictability offshore is indeed better. Um, the problems are with mountains and trees and all the rest of it mean that local weather, weather conditions are quite variable. Um, the predictability is about uh, a, a, a root mean error of 15% four or five hours ahead, uh, but you're contracting in this market 24 hours ahead. Sorry, that's 15% 24 hours ahead. It gets better the closer you get. 
Uh, so why shouldn't you pay the same price to everybody and encourage people to go out and develop the windiest sites first? Uh, and my answer is, you want a system that encourages them to develop the windiest sites first if they are least cost, bearing in mind that they may have high transmission costs, uh, but you want not to over reward them for being able to get those windy sites because I, the consumer and voter, are the final supporter and paying for this stuff, so I want to get it at lowest cost. Um, and the question of the uh, certainty to producers, yes, but uh, a feed-in tariff, um, which would have the property of being a guarantee on the revenue you'll get back, um, that's the way utilities are financed, and they get capital at least cost, and there's huge enthusiasm to invest in utilities. Uh, so the investor story, I think, can be overplayed, or we can get those investors in more cheaply. Yes? Uh, in the UK, what is the scheme for the financing of the transmission expansion? Who pays? Oh, well, of course, the final consumer pays. Um, we have a regulated but privately owned utility, um, the Transnational Grid, and they um, put forward their proposals for what they need to invest, uh, and then various engineers pour over it and decide whether that makes sense and whether they're doing it at least cost. Um, and then we try and build it onshore and then the locals complain and so we finish up doing offshore DC links which are just unbelievably expensive um, partly because the National Grid doesn't have the incentive to bribe the local communities to put it onshore uh, but if it all passes those hurdles and the regulator says fine then they can propose a set of prices which will deliver the revenue to finance it and that's never been a problem so these are, these are financeable at relatively low costs of capital, like 5% weighted average cost of capital in real terms. And we are building and investing a huge amount in the transmission system precisely to bring all this wind, uh, both from offshore to onshore and from Scotland down to London. Yes? Uh, my ignorance of the uh, mixed the UK electrical generation system is, uh, makes me ask this question, which is the main technology that is used as a backup uh, uh, for, for the wind variations? I should have explained. Um, we have um, a relatively balanced system in which, roughly speaking, one-third gas, one-third coal, one-third nuclear. Uh, the gas coal margin varies hugely with the relative prices, so we were shifting out of coal into gas, and now European gas prices are high, and you have forced coal onto the world market and driven down its price, so uh, the coal share has gone up. Um, what backs up wind? Uh, curiously, the most flexible plant in the system is the old coal plant, and that's typically what responds, uh, especially as the uh, well, I should rephrase that. When gas was cheaper than coal and gas ran base load, coal did all the flexing. Um, now that gas is moving up and becoming more expensive, gas is doing more of the flexing. Looking ahead, when we have a, a significant share of wind, it will almost certainly be open cycle combustion turbines. Yes? Sorry to ask the cost question again. Um, just to give a, a sense of scale, the total cost of the um, subsidies for building that level of wind, and roughly what is the cost of the inefficiency that you're rating against? Because I sort of have a sense it's a bit like bush gas in the sun, and the falls going to kill you, um, whether you drown in the bottom or maybe you're um, Okay, so the government has just published the strike prices for wind. Onshore, £100 a megawatt hour. Uh, which is way higher than almost anywhere else I know. Um, and they're partly doing that because they are introducing a new system and running it in parallel with an existing system which was incredibly generous, and so they have to make it equally incredibly generous. Uh, so if you think of the wholesale prices in the 50 to 60 pounds a megawatt hour with the carbon price, uh, then uh, it's uh, 30 or 40 pounds a megawatt hour. 
and uh, we're aiming at 100 terawatt hours of renewables by 2020, so you can do the maths, but it's pretty expensive. And the answer to, are we doing it at least cost and how much cheaper could it have been, I think we could get the weighted average cost of capital down almost 50%, and this is almost all capital, so we could almost halve the cost of the installation. Um, now, it's true that uh, you could say that's redistribution from consumers to bankers. There are some people who think that's fine, uh, but consumers don't. Yes, I think this will have to be the last question. Your, your comment about financing is interesting because one of the trends in Europe is that uh, many EU member countries that have supported renewables in the past are starting to institute retroactive incentive reductions that are affecting existing projects that have been financed based on certain information and certain incentive levels. So what that's starting to do is introduce some degree of uh, policy risk into the financial decision matrix and I'm curious to know if that could potentially have ripple effects uh, in the UK since it's uh, in the EU area. Oh, it sure does have ripple effects. It causes people to come from dodgy countries like Spain to Britain because the one thing our contracts do is that they're enforceable in the courts who've been remarkably good at defending property rights. So essentially what the new reforms are in time, uh, in, uh, intended to do is to remove the policy risk which has been extremely high because we have had four white papers wondering what the hell we want to do. Whether we want nuclear, whether we don't want nuclear, whether we want wind, whether we want offshore wind, and so on and so forth. And the idea behind the latest reform is to remove all that doubt, provide bankable contracts to the lucky people who can get them, uh, and just wait for the mass of enthusiastic investors to pile out of all the other countries uh, the Germans who've lost all the money on the nuclear and the Spanish who've lost all the money on the past wind investments uh, and come knocking on our door. With that, I thank you and we'll close the session. <laughs>